Hi, my name is Rich DeStanislaw. I'm with the Doc Fritchie chapter of Trout Unlimited, and I'm your feature tire for today. Today, I would like to introduce you into tying the parachute mayfly dun. I'm a dry fly fisherman, and nothing excites me more than being on the water right when the mayflies are hatching. To match the hatch to me is one of the ultimates. I tie all of my mayfly dun patterns, parachute style, from my tiny blue winged olives in a size 20 up to my March Browns in a size 10. To me, I look at the outstanding characteristics, the floatability, how the, the fish would perceive the fly coming down, and I think I've incorporated this into the pattern that I'm about to show you. So I'd like to say, let's sit down and tie a mayfly parachute. We're going to tie the parachute mayfly done, which is a dry fly. Whenever I tie a dry fly, I want to think about it and say, what are the things that are going to make this thing float? Because that's what I want it to do. So I'm going to use materials that are going to help this thing to float. I'm using a dry, a standard dry fly hook, standard length, extra fine wire. Now wire doesn't float but the extra fine wire doesn't make it sink as fast as some other things. For the wing, I'm going to be using high-vis antron fibers. And I do this for a couple of reasons. The high-vis is good visibility on the water. The nice crinkle uh, traps air bubbles. So it makes a great wing. It stands up under pressure. I'm going to use super fine poly. Uh, as opposed to fur, superfine poly floats. And I'm going to be using a very high quality hackle. This is a whiting saddle hackle from a rooster. And what makes it great is the fact that the fibers are uniform the whole way. It's web free, flexible stem, and it wraps easily and it helps the fly to float nicely. Now, I'm starting off. The first thing I'm going to do is tie the wing on. I'm using a Vivas 10 aught rusty brown thread. And with all flies, I'm putting down a base coat first, and I'm concentrating on the first half of the hook, and I'm putting a nice base coat down. Now, I, I leave my bobbin hang at roughly two thirds up the hook shank. And that's, I leave it hang right where I want the wing to be. Now I've taken off a strip of about an eighth of an inch of the high vis fibers. And I'm going to cut the fibers at about an inch and a half in length. What I like to do with my wings is tie the high vis fibers right at the half way point on the hook and make about four turns of thread. Then stand these up together and start wrapping my thread around the base of the wing. And I'm going to go about an eighth of an inch up. This does two things. It pulls these two halves into one single wing, and it also provides a post down at the base here for when I tie my hackle on, that it's a good solid post. The reason I double these is because when I tie this fly onto my leader and fish it, I don't want to pull the wing out. If I would tie the wing on and tie it back here with one single strand, Every time I tie that fly on, I risk the chance of pulling the wing out. When I've doubled this, there's no chance that I'm pulling this wing off the fly. Now, there's my wing. Don't worry about the length because I'm going to trim it down later. All I want to do is get it on at this time. Now, I'm going to start working my thread back and coating the base of the shank of the hook. I'm going back to the bend and I'm going to put tail fibers on. Some people like to use microfibits for tails. I think they're a bit stiff. I really like these Coke de Leon tailing fiber feathers. They're speckled very nicely. They're stiff. 
and I'm going to cut about six fibers out. These are going to serve as my tails on the mayfly. I want the tails to be about as long as the shank of the hook. Now, as I've wrapped this on, I'm not counting on this tail to support the fly. The tail is merely suggestive and the fish is going to see that the fly has a tail. I'm going to take my bobbin and make three good turns underneath the tail, then with my fingernail, I'm going to slide those turns up to slightly raise the tail at an angle. So I have a nice tail showing. I'm not counting on it for support, but the tail is there, very attractive in appearance. For the abdomen, I want to use a turkey biot. Now, the funny thing about the turkey biots is both sides of the biot are not the same. You'll notice that one side has a very solid color to it, while the other side is very transparent. And when you tie this biot in, it's going to create a very segmented appearance on this fly. Whether you want a suggestion of a strong segmentation on your fly, if that's the case, then this solid si striped side is called the flu. Then when I tie this in by the point, I want the flu facing away from me as I tie this fiber in. If I want a smoother fly with subtle segmentation, I would tie the transparent side. It's really your choice. I've tied the flue on top of the hook shank, and I've done it with the flue away from me. I want a strong segmented appearing fly. Now, I've taken my thread back to the bend of the hook where the tail is, tied the biot in, and I'm working my way back up with my thread, and I'm going to cross over to right in front of the wing and let my bobbin hang there. With my hackle pliers, I'm going to grasp the biot, and I'm going to start wrapping without twisting from the back of the fly. I'm laying this right next to the wrap behind it and I'm working my way up to the wing. You can see the suggested of the segmentation by the raised flu on the biop. When I get up to the wing with my hackle pliers, I'm going to catch it with my thread behind the wing, in front of the wing, behind the wing, in front of the wing, behind the wing, in front of the wing. I've trapped this and locked it in place right where I want it. I'm going to nudge the bobbin out of the way with my finger, trim off the excess biot, and there's the abdomen. The next thing I want to do is tie the hackle in. I've selected a bronze colored whiting hackle. It's from a rooster saddle, a whiting red label rooster saddle, bronze color. I have this sized for a 12. I'm tying this in a 12, by the way, so it's easier to see. Normally I would tie my Hendrickson's either in 12s or 14s. And what I'm going to do is where the, the stem is, I'm going to use my scissors and cut where I'm going to tie this in. 
By leaving these little stubs out, when I tie this in, my thread catches those stubs and locks this hackle into place. I'm going to put the base of the hackle that I'm tying in in front of the wing, tie it in, and then Ray, I'm going to hold the hackle up and tie the hackle around the base of the wing where I had those other wraps before. Because when I start making my turns of hackle, I'm going to work my way down. Now, the hackle's tied in. The next thing I want to do is put in the thorax of this fly. And because I want this to float, I'm using super fine poly. This is a female Hendrickson, so I'm using a, a pinkish tan color. The poly makes this float as opposed to fur, which absorbs water and would sink the fly easily. This super fine poly will help the fly float. So I pulled off just a little bit of dubbing. And when I say a little bit, I'm really talking a little bit. People tend to use too much dubbing. And I've pulled a little bit off. And if I am struggling on making a rope of the dubbing, I just stick my finger in some tacky wax, dubbing wax, which helps me to get this poly around my thread so that I have about a three inch rope. There. And what I'm going to do is start wrapping. I'm going to start in front of the wing, get the hackle out of the way, come behind the wing and cover over the end of that turkey biot that I had. And I'm going to make a kind of robust thorax. And I'm going to work my way up toward the eye. Now, I'm going to take my hackle and I'm going to start making turns in a, to me, I'm a right-handed tire. I'm going counterclockwise and I'm making each turn under the previous turn. Now, on big flies, I like to make four to five turns of hackle. I want this thing to float. And after I made this, my, if I continued my turn, I would still be going this direction counterclockwise because I'm a right-handed tire. When I turn my thread to lock this hackle into place, I'm actually tightening the hackle. Had I gone around the other way and tried to, to lock the hackle in, I'd be loosening the hackle. So that's why it was important for me to go counterclockwise as I put this hackle into place. I'm going to reach down. I'm going to, at the same time, grab the hackle and the wing and gently pull them back out of the way to lock this fiber into place. And I'm going to make about four turns to lock the hackle in. Now, you'll see that the wing is still back and the hackle is pulled back. That's great. It's all out of the way. I can make clean trims of strands, excess strands. I'm going to make a couple of more turns on the head. And while everything is pulled back, it gives me enough room to use my whip finisher and get in and make about five turns cleanly for the head of this fly. And I've whip finished it off. As I cut my thread, I'm now ready to take the wing, stand the wing back up into place. Not quite done yet. I'm going to remove it from the vise. 
using my first finger and my thumb, I'm going to grasp the wing down near the base and I'm going to squeeze together and try to compress the hackle turns, compress them down onto the fly body. I'm going to squeeze and compress. That will help the flotation. Now I'm going to hold this fly in my hand and say, now I need to trim the wing. And I want the wing to be roughly the length of the body. So I'm going to trim this to length. And I have my finished fly. One of the nice things I like about these, these uh, parachutes, the high-vis fibers are easy to see on the water. It floats because the air bubbles are trapped between all these crinkly fibers. The polythorax helps the fly to float. The high-quality hackle helps the fly to float. So it's a good pattern for hatching duns. Now, let's say you're in a sulfur hatch. And the sulfur hatch happens, oh, maybe it's 7 o'clock in the evening. You have about 45 minutes of daylight. You can clearly see the duns are hatching and the fish are taking the duns. You're seeing the fish's nose come up and go down on top of the fly. They're taking duns. Now, after about 20 minutes, that's dying off. You're not seeing so many rises as you used to. And you look up in the air and you see a sulfur spinner swarm. And you, oh gosh, it's getting almost dark. It's going to be hard to see to change flies. The nice thing about the parachutes, you simply take your nippers, scissors that are on your vest, and you cut this post off, the wing post, and now it's a spinner fly. You don't have to change flies. So to me, this is a very versatile fly. It's a good cross between uh, a realistic fly and an impressionistic fly. It can serve both as a dun and as a spinner. So I carry these in all my mayfly patterns from blue winged olives to Hendrickson's to sulfurs to March Browns to light Cahills, blue quills, all of them. It's the same style of tie. The colors and sizes are different. That's the only distinction. So if you can tie this parachute and carry these, you've covered all the major hatches of the East. So I think it's a good fly to have in your pocket.